Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Kenny. Welcome to ESPN Classics Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports figures remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. Over the next half hour, we'll count down the top five reasons you can't blame Anna Kornikova for never winning a WTA singles title. But first, let's take a snapshot into the past, or maybe a close-up of a woman who learned early on that international stardom wasn't all about winning. Another tennis whiz kit. She's just 10 years old, and this contender comes from a country better known for borscht than baselines. When Kornikova first came out, she was a prodigy. I mean, she was a fantastic junior, and she was this phenomenal talent. Everyone was very excited about her. I must win, I must play hard, and I gotta win. At 14 years old, she won the Orange Bowl Championships. That's the 18 and under championships. She was winning junior international titles. So she was the real deal. After years of build-up, she hit the WTA Tour in the fall of 1995. And the next year, she won the Most Impressive Newcomer Award. With potential as undeniable as her beauty, Anna Kornikova, at 15, demonstrated she had the stuff of stardom. When she hit the Pro Tour, she didn't waltz on, she didn't come quietly, she stampeded on and did the merengue right into the center of the dance floor. In June of 1997, Kornikova, ranked 42nd in the world, made her Wimbledon debut amid much fanfare and made it to the semifinals. She was a sensation. She knew how to play on grass, she was very confident, she carried herself really like a veteran. Well, there's one of those forehand rockets. She's not a pretender anymore. I mean, she's here to stay, unlike, say, a Venus Williams, who really hasn't shown us that yet. Raising the roof. The following March, at the Lipton Championships in Florida, Kornikova seemed on the verge of winning her first title. Yeah! On consecutive days, she dispatched four top ten players before losing to Venus Williams in her first WTA final. Everybody at that point believed that Anna Kornikova would not only win a tennis tournament, but would win a Grand Slam. By 2000, Kornikova, despite being ranked eighth in the world, was still without a title. Yet she was becoming ever more prominent in the public eye. Somewhere along the way, she turned from being this great tennis player into this industry. And you can't do both. You can't be a one-woman multinational corporation and be a fantastic tennis player. It's a question of uh, putting a lot of effort into it. Spend more time on the tennis court instead of doing the uh, TV commercials. Anna Kornikova. Congratulations, you won a car. If she's not doing a calendar shoot, she's doing an MTV shoot. If she's not endorsing a sports bra and doing a press conference there, she's doing a, an Adidas shoot. At the same time, she tried to keep an eye on the tennis ball, but as time passed, uh, it was very difficult to do everything. If she really, really want, had that burning desire to play well and to win Grand Slams and beat top players, then tone down on the press and get back to work. She wasn't training or practicing anywhere near as much as she should have. Her interest in doing the other stuff was very detrimental to her ability to become a better tennis player. Kornikova didn't improve that much from when she turned 16, 17 years of age. Most people, they're going to get better. But Kornikova stalled, and then she became a worse player. Well, that's double fault number 15. Her serve totally collapsed. I remember seeing a match where she double faulted 31 times. Double fault number three in a row. Anna Kornikova completed the coveted Anna Slam yesterday by getting knocked out of the first round of the U.S. Open in 44 minutes. Ooh. This gives her first round KOs from the Australian, French, Wimbledon, and U.S. Open this year. When you're talking Kornikova, you're talking quickly over. <laughs> After her sensational Wimbledon debut, Kornikova failed to advance past the quarterfinals in her next 17 Grand Slam tournaments. <laughs> At 21, and with her tennis game running on vapors, she faced a dreary prospect. 
Finally, towards the end of her career, she said, I can't go out without having won a WTA Tour title. That will be on my epitaph. Anna Karnikova was looking anywhere for a place to win a title. I mean, she's going to places like uh, tennis powerhouses like Luxembourg, big time cities like Acapulco. I mean, it was like a club med trip. And there was one tournament where all the great players were going at each other and she was playing, you know, Polish Lobotnik in uh, Argentina or something. Just what? She's played in over 120 tennis tournaments, yep. and she's over. She could not win a two-woman tournament against Phyllis Diller. Ah. She stinks. By the spring of 2003, Kornikova was 0 for 123 in WTA tournaments. While cameras clicked, the game passed her by. Even Katrina Srobotnik has won a tournament. The queen of Slovenia, Eleni Danilidou. The Greek goddess has won a tournament. When you look at some of the Muppets who've won WGA Tour titles, you have to look at Kornikova and say, you are a very silly girl to have retired with that much talent without so much as a single trophy. She will forever be known as this very famous, very beautiful woman who never won a tennis tournament. You've just seen why the talented player never lived up to her potential. But before we count down the top five reasons you can't blame Anna for never winning a WTA singles title, here are a few points in her favor that didn't make the short list. We call them the best of the rest. Hey, she did win in doubles. Oh, oh, great shot. You watch her play doubles. She's fantastic. Anna's forte was movement, and she was brilliant at the net. She was a genius. She smelled where the ball was. That's good hands from Kornikova. Over a four-year stretch, Kornikova won 16 doubles titles, including two Grand Slam tournaments, and earned a number one world ranking in 1999. She returned well, she came to net well, um, and it looked like she had a lot of fun, too. It was more fun for her to play doubles and singles. Another best of the rest from Russia with loves. Before she could know the taste of victory on the WTA circuit, Kornikova was swept away by more personal pleasures while still too young to gain admittance to an R-rated movie. First there was Sergei Fedorov, the hockey player, then there was Pavel Bure, the hockey player. Those two sparred against each other for her attention and there were rumors of million dollar engagement rings. She was distracted by these romances and by the Detroit Red Wings. She was so hot that she probably didn't have as much time for tennis as she might have had. In 2001, singer Enrique Iglesias invited Kornikova to make a music video. While they were still dancing, her first love, tennis, slipped away. You can blame these older men because they took the focus that a 15 or 16 year old tennis prodigy usually has and they turned her into a 24 or 25 year old woman who's worried about things that most of the young tennis players her age didn't have to deal with. Our final best of the rest, the Russian Revolution. Lenin demands an end to the old order by violent means. Yet, not that one, the tennis one. She's a pioneer on a cornucopia. She started the Russian Revolution. She has sparked off a whole lot of other girls who want to be top line stars. The Wimbledon champion, Maria Sharapova. Anna Kornikova might not have won a WTA singles title, but look at the influx of Russian women. And that might be Anna Kornikova's greatest achievement. Eight of the top players on the WTA tour at one time were Russian. Why? Because they wanted to be like Anna. Petrova. Kuznetsova. Sharapova. I thank Anna Kornikova. We have Sharapova and all these Ovas. You know how hot the Ovas are? Anytime the Ovas step on the court, game on. Bad bones. Kornikova's ill-fated search for victory was hampered by physical setbacks. I was just unfortunate to get injured a lot of times and, and uh, never quite, you know, went all the way. Where I began to play really, really well and uh, was kind of in a routine, I started getting injured. She's been very, very hampered by injuries. Uh, she's a player, I think, who needs confidence, who needs to play a lot, needs to really get in the groove with her game. Ranked 11th in June of 1998, Kornikova played second-ranked Steffi Graf in a tune-up match before Wimbledon. Anna Kornikova's grass-court play 
oh, the, the lawns at Eastbourne. It was so impressive. It was all coming together for her. She beat Graf in the quarterfinals at Eastbourne. But in doing that, she hurt her thumb. And while she was able to complete that match, she wasn't able to play again after that. And she had to pull out of Wimbledon, and then she took the next few weeks off. It ruined the momentum that, that she was starting to get. And that's something that happened to Kornikova again, again, and again. Over the next four years, Kornikova incurred multiple injuries, including stress fractures in her feet, a torn ligament, and a sprained ankle. Suffering from an inoperable chronic back problem, she played her last WTA event in 2003. In Kornikova's defense, you have to look at the number of very serious injuries that she had to put up with. These are all factors that explain her lack of success. Were she not injured, she would have won a WTA title. We are just getting started. Up next, reason number four. Allah Almighty. Kornikova's mother, Allah, was a Muscovite version of the classic American stage mom. After bringing her daughter to America and enrolling her in Nick Volateri's tennis camp, the almighty Allah stayed in place and pushed the buttons. She was very, you know, pushy, pushing, pushing Anna very hard, sometimes too hard. I've seen her on the practice court with Anna, dictating how she should hit a ball. I've seen her push Nick Volateri aside and say, you know, I will take over now. And afterwards made Anna do running drills, and Anna was already exhausted and she left the court in tears. Suddenly she was giving coaching advice. This was not someone who knew anything about tennis. She was a long distance runner. And yet she seemed suddenly to know everything about tennis. And when you're telling Nick Volateri how to coach, that's not gonna win. She looked to her mother after every single solitary stroke. She trusted mom. She, that's, your, that's your foundation, your base. And it just kind of blows up on you sometimes. In 1997, Volateri and Kornikova went their separate ways. At some point, her mother became disenchanted with other coaches, and her mother took over the coaching, and I don't think that was a good move. Why not get some opinions of people that have been there, that know the game inside and out, and maybe can help you work on a few of those things? In Allah's case, I blame her because she took Anna away from the best coaches. And as a result, maybe Anna wasn't allowed to become the best player she could possibly be. You look at the numbers, 123 tournaments when her mother was involved, no wins. Land of opportunity. Growing up amid the squalor of post-communist Russia, Anna's mother, Ala, sought a future without fear and hunger for her daughter. She chose America. Russians could face what the experts tonight call a prolonged crisis. You have to remember where she came from, a country that had nothing. There was this high rate of unemployment. There wasn't food in the grocery stores. They couldn't have tennis balls. There was no court time. She lived in a one-room apartment with her uh, mother and father. They were playing outside in 35, 30-degree temperatures with socks pulled over their racket arms and their rackets. Conditions in Moscow were quite bad. The government stopped giving money to the sport facilities, to sport clubs. No financing, no chance to play tournaments, and the only chance left for her at that time was to go abroad. Anna was 10 when she and her mother arrived in Florida in 1992. After she turned pro at 14, the full measure of the American dream lay at her feet. When that braid started flopping around behind her head, and people started watching the way she put her ball in her teeny weeny shorts, she wasn't stupid. She said, wait a minute, I can make more money. She had multi-million dollar contracts with Adidas when she was 12 years old. How can you knock her when she's making the sort of money that she is making from it? The commercial side of the game is her grand slam. In 2000, she's making less than a million dollars in prize money and then she's making 10 to 15 million dollars off the court. Obviously, the priority is off the court. You can't blame her if she's trying to maximize the income when the buddy you grew up with back in Russia can't even get a job. 
I've grown up with the first wave of Russian tennis players that were able to play professionally and make money. They are ingrained because of where they come from that if you can make money, that is your number one objective. It's more important than winning titles. Anna has not been able to turn that down, and I can't say that I blame her. She lived the American dream. She didn't win a WTA singles title, but she's probably richer and more famous and more successful than any of the women who did win singles titles at the same time. If you haven't bought into our argument yet, maybe reason number two will help. Wonder Women. While Kornikova flourished off the court, on it, the competition was too powerful for her to succeed at the highest level. One reason you can't blame Anna Kornikova for not winning a singles title is that she came along in one of these eras that was like the 60s in rock and roll. <laughs> Instead of the super bands, these were super babes. She played in a very difficult time in, in, on the tour where there were so many Hall of Famers that played big-time power tennis. Stephanie Graf, her 20th Grand Slam win. Graf, probably one of the best athletes ever, had the huge forehand and, and the great slice. And then you had the Williams sisters that were incredibly athletic. That's a terrific first serve. The Williams sisters are bringing big power into the game, along with Lindsay Davenport. Too much power from Davenport. Then you had Martina Hingis, who was a thoughtful player. Martina just anticipates shots so well. So you're talking about great talents of the game. And I don't think Kornikova was ever that. When matched with lower-ranked players, Kornikova compiled an impressive 134 and 34 record. But she was just 17 and 59 against top 10 opponents. She was judged against them because of her high profile, but she never really was going to achieve as much as them. And that, in a way, threw her lack of achievement into an even darker light. When it came to the upper crust of the game, she was overmatched. And it wasn't a question that she didn't care enough. It was a question that they were essentially better than she was. Winning didn't matter. While losing in every WTA tournament, exactly who did she really let down? Who cares? Who really cares? Marilyn Monroe is the biggest star in movie history. But if you look at her career, she didn't win any Oscars, but she sold the industry. Anna Kornikova, the very same one. Even if she wasn't winning majors or winning even regular tour events, she had it. She became a true crossover star and probably the biggest ever crossover star in tennis. 95% of the people who even recognize Anna Kornikova's name now recognize her more for her looks than any match she ever won. She is a breathtakingly beautiful woman. It's hard to get past that when you're a spectator and you're watching her play tennis. It's because she is, you know, she just looks great. She is a sex symbol. She sells sex in tennis. And she makes a very good living out of it. And in many respects, what on earth is wrong with that? I'm getting ready to walk across the street, and all of a sudden this double-decker bus comes by, and it's plaster. It's Anna Kornikova in a sports bra at Wimbledon. That's fantastic. I have a hard time with someone saying, gosh, she hasn't won a tournament, but she's getting all this notoriety because she's beautiful. Great, bring her in. In 2005, two years after her last WTA match, Kornikova was still earning upwards of $4 million from endorsements. She had won more fans than the biggest names in sports. She changed the way people looked at the game of tennis worldwide. At one point, her website got more hits than Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan combined. Prize money went up and sponsorship went up and attention went up because Anna Kornikova was out there. Give her credit for that. You can't blame Anna Kornikova for never winning a WTA singles title because at the same time, she presided over unprecedented growth in women's tennis just by her presence on the court. She raised the profile, she made it relevant, she wanted us to know how good they were in addition to how they look. Vince Lombardi said winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Vince didn't meet Anna Kornikova. 
Well, there you have it. The top five reasons Anna Kornikova shouldn't be blamed for never winning a WTA singles title. Hopefully, we've given you a new way to look at one of the most publicized tennis players of her generation. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for watching. I started practicing with Anna at 12 years old, and each year that we would hit, she would come with a little less clothing. By the last time we hit, she was 16 or 17. She just had a little sport bra and some little cotton panty things on. I actually said, next year, are you coming completely naked? And she said, in your dreams.